All right, Acts chapter 24. Look down at verse number 10. It says this, Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, Forasmuch as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that, thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Verse number 14 is my text verse this morning. It says, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, the God of my fathers, the God of of my fathers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. I sure do love you, dear Lord. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for these who came. Thank you for those who are watching online. And Lord, I just pray at this time, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll please give me your power. I pray, dear Lord, for the mind of Christ. Help me to say that only which you once said. And then I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend for those watching online as well. Lord, if there's anybody that needs to be saved under the sound of my voice, Lord, help them to get saved today. And Lord, we'll give you all the glory for what you'll do. Please bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. The God of my fathers. I want you to understand something this morning by way of introduction. We have a very personal God. It has always been amazing how God can do all that he does and still have time for each of us individually. It's just an amazing thought. The God of the universe who holds the entire universe together all at the same time has time for us individually. What an amazing God. By way of introduction, I'm going to give you six points this morning. But by way of introduction, I want to read you uh, three different passages. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And uh, just kind of laying the foundation for this, this thought. The God of my fathers. All right. John chapter 10. And I'd like you to look down at verse number 3. John chapter 10. And if you would please, look down at verse number 3. In John chapter 10 and verse 3, it says this, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep and am known of mine. All right? So we see here in this verse, that in this passage, that God says he knows us by name. He knows us by name. Now think of that. There's, there's almost 8 billion people on this planet at this moment, and he knows us all by name. I think that's amazing. You know, I, I try very hard to remember people's names. I really do, especially those that are close to me, like my wife and my children. I um, try to remember their names. But no, seriously, I try to remember everybody's names because it really really is important. And and God has given me the ability beyond uh, beyond my ability. But one of the things that I struggle with is I'm a chaplain, marketplace chaplains. I have five different businesses that I go to. And of those five businesses, there are about 400 employees altogether. 
And then every week, there's at least someone who quits or gets let go. And there's at least one new employee, like every week. So it's so hard for me to remember every single person's names. And, and that's important, and I'm working at it. And I, I honestly pray, and I say, God, would you please Help me <laughs> to remember everybody's name that I'm supposed to remember. Uh, but you know what? God doesn't have that problem. God knows all of us by name. That's how personal he is. Let's look at another verse. Turn over to Matthew chapter number 10. This one's, this one's amusing to me. But it just shows, uh, it just shows how great our God is. Uh, Ma- Matthew chapter 10. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 29. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number uh, 29, all right? Matthew chapter 10. <laughs> yes, honey, I'm glad I know y'all's names, too. <laughs> My wife is listening in the kitchen here, and uh, she goes, I'm so glad you know our names. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10. And look at verse number 29. It says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall, to the, fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. PETA ought to look at that verse right there. Uh, humanity, mankind is more valuable than the animals on this earth. But anyway, uh, look what it says in verse 30. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Uh, God who holds the universe in his hand and he keeps everything together has time to number the hairs on our heads. But he does. You know, every day he, you know, I wake up and God goes, 1,980, whoops, uh, 1,972 today, <laughs> hairs on my head, you know. Uh, God, but but that's, how, that's how personal God is. He literally has every hair on your head numbered. That's how much he cares about you. That blows my mind. It absolutely blows my mind. Let's look at another verse. Turn over, please, to Psalms. Let's see here, chapter 17 and verse 8. Psalms 17 and verse 8. Look at that one now. Psalms 17 and verse number 8. Psalms chapter 17 and verse number 8. Look what it says here. It says in Psalms 17 verse 8, it says, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Now, David wrote this psalm. It's a prayer of David. And David said, keep me as the apple of the eye. Now, that expression, the apple of the eye, we don't really use it very much. But here's what it means. It means the center of focus. The apple of, a, the, apple of the eye is the center of focus. So the way you look at it is God has took David and put him in his hand. And God has said, David, you are the apple of of the eye you're the center of my focus everything else around is peripheral vision now y'all know what it means to be focused on something and then everything else is kind of peripheral right well god says david you're the apple of my eye and so what god tells us there is that we as his creation mankind we are the center of his focus everything else is peripheral So we see here how personal God is. He knows us by name. He has all the hairs on our head numbered. And then we are the center of his focus. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have, you know, doesn't pay attention to everything else. It just means we are the center of his focus. That's what he's concentrating on. So we see here how personable our God is. Let me give you six thoughts about our God and his relationship with us. Turn over back to Acts 24, and I want to read our text verse again, verse number 14, Acts chapter 24, and um, and verse number 14, it says this, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. All right, number one, uh, I'm going to give you six thoughts this morning about, how, about our God. Number one, he is the God of my fathers. He is the God 
of my fathers. Now, what does that mean? Here's what that means. God says, I'm the God of your heritage. I'm the God of your people. And by the way, being the God of my fathers means he, he's the God of the old and the proven way. The old and the proven way. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve. You, you, you trace that lineage, you know, and, and Abraham, you know, he's he had many sons, many sons had father Abraham. I'm one of him, and so are you. Let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm. Anyway, all right, but, um, but, but, but this is the God of our fathers. Now, listen to me very carefully. I have preached against contemporary Christianity. What I have not preached against is contemporary technology. So, for example, I was on Facebook the other day, and there's this meme about, you know, it has this dog, a little tiny, uh, uh, tiny dog. Um, I can't remember if it's a chihuahua or not or whatever, but it's got one of those, you know, it's got those teeth and all that, right? And um, so it said, 2010, pastors saying, Facebook is of the devil, like that. And then 2020 has the dog, same dog with a smiley face welcome to my live stream on facebook we're so glad to have you join us today well i've never preached against technology i don't preach against facebook i know facebook can be good can be used in a good way in a bad way um technology all technology can be used in a good way in a bad way um so facebook is just simply technology and thank god for it people can stay home today and uh, watch us online people all over the world we have missionaries that watch our services there, there was someone that, uh, right now watching doug moser uh moser from uh, chicago illinois thank you sir johnny lucero hey it's good to see you and kelly are watching here locally brandon humphrey from down in uh the denver area thank you for watching and uh, uh anna del piso thank you so much for watching from Firestone and so uh, there are people that uh, technology is not bad I mean it, it really is not um, I have never never preached against modern technology but what I will preach against when it comes to our contemporary Christianity is changing our Bible changing philosophies changing doctrine you know um, the Bible's still valid today no matter if it's 2020 no matter what. I mean, God still believes like he believed back in the very beginning of time. God hasn't changed his belief. There's a Bible verse that says there's no shadow of turning with God. That means there's no hint of him turning. His shadow doesn't even move. Like you don't look at his shadow and say, oh, I see what direction you're going now, God. No, the Bible says there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's no even hint of of God turning. The Bible says in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ the same, uh, or in the New Testament, it says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It says that, I believe, in the book of Hebrews. And then in the Old Testament, in Malachi, before the, uh, during the last book of the Old Testament, he says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. And so he is the God of my fathers. First of all, that means my heritage, my people, you know, Dating back, you know, thank God for the lineage that God's given us of our the faith of our fathers. Uh, I love that old song. Uh, give me the old time religion. Give me the old time religion. Give me the old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for our fathers. It was good for our fathers. It was good for our fathers. It's good enough for me. And there's lots of verses, right? So that's the kind of faith I have he's the God of my fathers not just my fathers but the old and the proven way the old and the proven way so when we look at this personal God he is the God of my fathers it's personal number two look at 2nd Samuel chapter 22 go all the way in the Old Testament now 2nd Samuel chapter 22 it's right before right after 1st Samuel <laughs> Just trying to be a blessing to all of you online that haven't opened your Bible in a while. But anyway, uh, Samuel chapter, oh, forgive me, I'm sorry. And uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. <laughs> Look down at verse number 1, please. 2 Samuel chapter 22. And uh, look down at verse number 1. You know, it's good to laugh in times like this. It really is. Laughter is a medicine. And uh, try to keep your spirit up. Don't, don't, you know, you're watching all. I, I heard this one governor, I think the governor of New York, no, Illinois, the governor of Illinois. He goes, I tell my children, don't watch CNN, MSNBC, and, and uh, CBS, and 
definitely don't watch Fox News. I mean, he actually said that. Definitely don't watch Fox News. But at any rate, don't watch news at all, man. Just if it's all doom and gloom and ah, uh, just, 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 you know, laughter. Get on my Facebook account or my Facebook page. Become friends with me. I post humor all the time. I mean, all the time. And uh, it, it, it really is a blessing. And uh, sometimes, you know, people appreciate my humor. Sometimes they don't. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, some of them are smart enough to understand it. Some of them are not. And uh, I put this one, uh, uh, let's see here. This is funny. I got to read it to you. My wife yelled from upstairs and asked, do you ever get a shooting pain across your body like someone's got a voodoo doll of you and they're stabbing it? Now, I'm downstairs, you know, and I look up and I sound concerned. I say, well, no, <laughs> not really. And then she responded, how about now? <laughs> so anyway, uh, but uh, God is good. Laugh, 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 laugh. No, that wasn't really my wife, but nonetheless, it was a funny joke. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 22, and uh, look at verse number 1. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him uh, out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress my, and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Who is God? First of all, he's the God of my fathers. Number two, he's the God of my rock. The God of my rock. What does that word rock refer to? It refers to a refuge and a defense. A refuge and a defense. David was singing a song to the Lord uh, because he was the uh, God of my rock. And, and what he was saying is God just delivered him out of, out of all of his enemies, out of the hand of all of his enemies and the hand of Saul. And he said, Lord, you're my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my my rock. He says, you're my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. And uh, he says, you saved me from violence. And then so here's David's response. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And then he said, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, God says, I want to be your rock. I want to be your rock. He's the God of my rock. Here's what this means. He will be there for you when fighting a battle. Every one of us has battles that we face. I remember when I was at Hiles Anderson College, Jack Hiles said, it's a jungle out there. It's a jungle out there. He was referring to the world. The world's a tough place to live. One of the things that I've observed in 26 years of pastoring is sometimes we can, we can shelter our kids too much from the world. Because when they become 18 and they move out, out of our home, they need to understand the world is not a, a necessarily a pleasant place to live. There's a lot of dangers in the world. It's a jungle. And we need to help them to have some sense about it and help them to have a game plan. And especially when it comes to uh, having God as their rock, I mean, we need to teach our children that because when they leave our house and go out in the world, it could be overwhelming at times if we've sheltered them too much. Our job as parents, really, are to prepare our children for the day that they leave us. I know we don't like to think about that. You know, we don't ever want them to leave us, but they need to. They need to become adults, and we need to prepare them for that day. And one of the ways we can prepare them that way is to teach them to have God as their rock. Because there is going to be battles. There is going to be fights. The devil is real. I know all of you know that. The devil's real, and he fights us tooth and nail every single day of our life as we live for God. It's, it's a great thing to have God as our rock. You know, I, I, as a political candidate, I've learned real quick running for office. By the way, for those of you that don't know, I'm still running for office. I, I, I did not make the cut through the assembly, I didn't get 30% vote. I got 25% vote. Dirty brick or brack or slap or rip. Uh, but I'm going to continue my run as a writing candidate. Now, that makes it much harder for me to win. It makes it much harder. So on the primary ballot for June 30th, it's going to have two names of candidates, and then it's going to have a place that says write-in. 
and people have to write my name in if I'm going to win. And I, I got a game plan for it. I went to meet with somebody on Tuesday uh, up in Greeley, um, a person who really likes me and, and is rooting for me to win. And he said, you know what I was thinking about? His name is Skip. He goes, you know what I was thinking about, Brother Corey? He said, I was thinking about Gideon. Gideon had 32,000 soldiers going up a, a, against, uh, to war against the Midianite army that had over 100,000 soldiers. And God came to Gideon with 32,000 soldiers against 100,000 soldiers. said, oh, you got too many. Tell everyone who's scared, go home. 22,000 went home. <laughs> and now there's 10,000 left. And I'm sure Gideon was going, oh, Lord. <laughs> All right, we got 10,000. And God said, Gideon, still too many. He said, what? We're one against ten on odds. He says, too many for me to get the victory. Tell them to go down, drink some water, give them a test, and then put, put, put them in two, two groups. And he said, all right, uh, based on how they drank the water. So uh, 300 men went down, got on their knees, and put their hands in the water and brought it up to their mouth like that, and that's how they drank. The other 9,700 went like this, put their heads all the way down, and just drank like that. And he said, take the 300 and put them over there. Take the 9,700 and put them over there. And I'm sure Gideon was saying, I'm only going to lose 300 this time. He said, tell the 9,700 to go home. And he was left with 300. 300 soldiers against over 100,000 soldiers. And God says, okay, now I, can, now I can give you the victory. And so what Skip, a friend of mine, was saying, he said, Corey, he goes, you didn't get the approval of the political class, the establishment, and you didn't make it on the, on the, um, uh, on the uh, caucus and, and assembly uh, um, um, vote. So he said, God was just putting all that stuff out the side and says, I'm going to do a miracle for you. I'm going to get you, I'm going to help you to win as a write-in candidate. And Because uh, listen, it's never been done before in the state of Colorado at the state level. <laughs> it's never been done before. But God kind of likes those kind of things. So anyway, uh, uh, so I've learned during this, this time I've been running for off office, I've got a lot of enemies. A lot of people that don't want me to win. I mean, they are brutal, they are dirty, they are rotten and skunky. They'll lie and slander about me. They'll make up outlandish things and then send it out as fact. And um, one of the most humorous things that I, that I heard the week before the assembly or, or caucus, the week before the caucus, someone was spreading a rumor that I have people come to my office and I fill up a gallon of water and I bless it and then I sell it to them for 20 bucks a gallon. That's the rumor that was going around, and trying to make me out to be a, a religious quack, you know. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, I mean come on, man, for real, because they were criticizing me for my water business. And, uh, but, but you know what? It's good to know that God's my rock. He's going to defend me when I'm attacked. He's going to be a place of refuge, a place of defense. And by the way, when God is my defense, ain't nobody breaking through God. And God wants to be your defense. Whatever battles you're facing, God is the God of my rock. Number three, look at Psalm 42. Turn over to Psalm chapter number uh, 42, please. Psalm chapter 42, moving right along. Amen. Psalm 42. We got till 1045. That's what time we're going to end, 1045. We started at 930. Psalm 42, and uh, look down at verse number 8. Psalm 42, in verse number 8. Oh, Doug Mosier, you're in South Dakota still. Uh, we're <laughs> just working. Okay, God bless you. Miss Annette, Emery, uh, nice to see you watching. God bless you, Miss Annette. All right, Psalm 42, verse number 8. It says, Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Number three, write this down. He is the God of my life. The God of my life. What does that mean? Here's what I wrote down. He wants to be more than just the Savior of your soul. He wants to be the God of your life. What does that mean? He cares about each step you take all throughout your life. He cares about each step. The Bible says the good steps, the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man. What does the steps re re refer to? That means every day of your life, every decision you make, every 
thing that you participate in. God is not just concerned in your destination of getting to heaven. He is concerned with your journey on the way to heaven. He wants to be the God of your life. There are some people that think, oh, God, thank you for saving my soul from going to hell. I've got my life under control. I'll take over from here on out. No, 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 no. Don't do that. If you weren't smart enough and uh, good enough and strong enough to save your soul from going to hell, you're not strong enough and good enough and smart enough to figure your life out without God. You need him to be the God of your life. I wrote this down. With God in your life, your life is always worth living. Think about that. With God in your life, your life is always worth living. In a day and age when people are so sad often and depressed and contemplate things like suicide. And, and, and what it is is they, they feel like their life has no meaning or nobody loves them or they're all alone. Listen, if God is in your life, your life always has meaning. You never have to feel depressed and discouraged, throwing in the towel, giving up, whatever the case may be, running you know, to another place, all that stuff. You know, God's in your life. He's the God of your life. Your life is important to him. He loves you. He wants to be there for you all throughout your life, every step and every moment of every day. God wants to be there as you look to get married. He wants to help you find the right spouse. God wants to be there, those of you that need jobs, to help you to find the right job. God cares about where you live. He cares about what church you attend. He cares about the school that you go to and the college, if you do go to college as an adult. Um, God cares about the car that you drive, even if it is a Ford. <laughs> Fix or repair daily, is that how it is? <laughs> it's so funny, we are such a Ford family. Four of us own Fords and uh, in our family. I got a Ford. My wife has a Ford. Uh, five of us. Ben has a Ford. Stephen has a Ford. And Joey has a Ford. Wow, how'd that happen? Good night in the morning. But anyway, I, it, 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 you know, as long as I, you, <laughs> my jokes have to change now. How, how can I make fun of Chevys? All right, here we go. But the fact of the matter is God cares about everything. He cares about your finances. He cares about the clothes on your back. He cares about the food in your cupboard. He cares about your daily necessities all throughout life. He is the God of my life. God cares about your life. I find that amazing. God not only holds the universe together and he keeps everything operational in the universe, but he cares about the clothes I wear, the food I eat, the money that's in my bank account, the house I live in, the car that I drive. He cares about my relationship with my spouse. He cares about my relationship with my children. Uh, one of the greatest things about the Bible, it's got the answers to every need that you have in life. Every need. He's the God of my life. God, number one, is the God of my fathers. Number two, he's the God of my rock, my defense. Number three, he's the God of my life. Number four, look at Psalm 43, just a couple of verses away. Look at verse two. Psalm 43. In verse two, it says, for thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Number, th number four, uh, God is the God of my strength. I love that. He is the God of my strength. What does that mean? That means he wants to give you what you need to make it. This is the ability to do whatever it is that God wants you to do in life. Have you ever felt like, I just can't make it anymore. I just can't take the next step. I don't know if I can handle this anymore. Yes, you can, if God's the God of your strength. How many of you have ever had a dead battery and you try to start your car? Oh, isn't that fun? You know what's worse than having a dead battery? Coming out and seeing your tire flat. You know what's worse than coming out and seeing your tire flat? Coming out to your, where your car was and it's gone. <laughs> I've experienced all three in my life. I've had you know, dead batteries try to, you know, there was a light left on in the car all night long, and I came out, and, and it's, it's got a dead battery. I came out in the garage one time, and, and my, my, my tire was flat. It was all the way flat, all the way down to the ground. And then in Chicago in 1994, my wife and I went into a, a bus parent's house, and they fed us lunch on Sunday afternoon, and I came out the door where my car was, and it was gone. Somebody had stole it. So I've gotten all three of those. Uh, but let's, let's focus on the dead battery. If you've ever had a dead battery, what's the most, the simplest and the quickest and the easiest resolution to get going again? Jumper cables, right? Take your jumper cables and hook it up to your battery. 
and then find someone whose battery's full and hook it up to them. And what you do is you can start your car by draw, drawing from the life of another person's battery, from the strength of that battery. So there's a verse in the Bible that I was confused about. It's Isaiah 40, 31. It's a famous verse. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I used to think Isaiah 40, 31 just simply meant God would recharge your strength, like recharge your battery. I used to think that's what it meant. But you know what my battery has? You ready for this? It has limits. It can only be so strong, only have so much strength. So what Isaiah 40, 31 is, I believe it is, is God says, take your jumper cables, hook it up to your dead battery, and then on the other end, hook it up to my battery, and ready? He says, draw from my strength. God didn't just come down from heaven and just put strength in my battery when it was dead. What God said is, hook up your dead battery to my battery through jumper cables, and then just draw from my strength. You know what? My strength is limited. God's strength is unlimited. So Isaiah 40, 31 doesn't mean God just recharges my battery to the level that it can be charged at. He says, no, draw strength from my battery. And if I draw strength from God's battery, I can do anything that God wants me to do. There's no limit. So don't ever take the jumper cables off of God's battery. Just be hooked up to his battery and draw strength from him every single day of your life. When you feel like you just don't know if you can make it anymore, that's because you're operating on your strength and your strength will eventually wear out. Operate on God's strength. Let God be the God of your strength. Number five, we're almost done. Look at Psalm 59. Turn over to Psalm 59. Psalm 59. And look down, if you would please, Psalm 59 and verse 10. Psalm 59, and look down at verse number 10. In Psalm 59 and verse 10, it says this, The God of my mercy shall prevent me, God shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. Look at verse 17. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Number five, write this down. He is the God of my mercy. The God of my mercy. You know what this means? You know what mercy means? Let me tell you what mercy means. It means favor instead of wrath. Mercy means, you ready for this? Tenderness. For God to be merciful to us, it means he's tender to us. What else does mercy mean? You ready, you ready for this? To be treated better than deserved. God's mercy is he treats us better than we deserve. And then lastly, mercy means compassion. It means compassion. You know, when I was a younger preacher, can you believe I started this church when I was 25 years of age? I feel like I had no business starting the church at age 25. I should have waited until I was 30. But anyway, you know, if, if anybody asks me now, uh, how, how, how old do you need to be to, to pastor a church? I'm, I just say 30 years or older. That's what I say. Uh, if you're 25, go, go look, be an assistant pastor somewhere for a while, learn under somebody, and get some experience. But, because all the experience that I got at age 25 was, was trial and error as a pastor. And I'd rather have trial and error as an assistant pastor. Uh, that'd be better because then my pastor would make up for my errors. <laughs> but uh, it, there was nobody to turn to at age 25. When I had errors as a pastor, then it was me and that was it. But anyway, uh, when I was 25, I used to be more judgmental than I am now. It's easy for a person to be judgmental when they are knowing the truth and what is right. When you know the truth and when you know what is right... It's easy for you, the temptation is to judge. Well, hey, this sin is wrong, and if you're committing the sin, you're not right with God. So, I've learned over the years, however, that sometimes people commit sins and they don't realize they're sinning. Nobody ever taught them that it was wrong 
Or maybe they were taught the opposite in the public school or wherever they were, uh, false religion. And they just, they, they, they didn't know that what they were taught was false heresy, you know, false, relig- you know, false doctrine. And, um, and so when I look at people now at the age of 50, I'm a lot more merciful. I don't judge people hardly ever anymore. If someone commits a sin, I don't necessarily just think they're not right with God. I don't just jump to that conclusion. I remember when I was 25 years of age, I'd see a teenager or a young adult walking in gothic clothing, you know, black, everywhere, chains, tattoos, hair spiked and pointed, and then white makeup on his face. And I'd, be, I'd look at them, and, and in my heart I would say, ha, oh, look at that rebel punk. Look at that wicked God hater. Well, um, I was wrong. Because that's not always the case. Sometimes it is, but not always. So as, as the years have gone, 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 and I've matured and grown in the Lord, I'll go up to those people and give them a track, and I'll try to talk to them with love and compassion. And you know, most of those people are very tenderhearted. Most of those people have just been hurt deeply, either abused or something really bad happened to them. And all they're saying is, will anybody in the world notice I'm here? A lot of them, that's why they're wearing those clothes, and that's why they look the way they look. They're not evil in their heart. They're brokenhearted. And if I just talk to them like a decent human being and share some love and compassion, I've been able to lead lots of them to the Lord. Some of these gang teenagers, you know, they, they put up the bravado of being so tough. Man, I'll go to them, and I'll just shoot straight with them and talk to them kindly and lovingly and I've got to lead many of them to the Lord. Many of them. You know why? Because I don't want to judge people. I don't want to look. I'm not their judge. God is. And God's the God of mercy. Do you know there's a second reason why I'm more merciful as a 50-year-old than I was as a 25-year-old? Do you know why? Because I appreciate so much more as I get older the mercy that God gives to me. And because I know God is God puts up with me, Oh, my soul. If y'all knew my sins, if y'all knew my flesh, if y'all knew the mistakes I've made, some of you would never come back to this church again. But the very fact that God allows me to be the pastor, the very fact that God puts up with me. You know, at any moment of any day, God could just say, that's it, I'm done with you. Come to heaven, (laughs) your life's over. At any moment of any day, he could do that. The Bible says it's of his mercies that we're not consumed. Great is thy faithfulness. It says that in Ecclesiastes. Only of his mercies. And you know what? I appreciate so much how merciful God has been to me. I just want to share that mercy with others. I look at Paul the Apostle. At the end of his life, just before he was going to be executed for the cause of Christ, He wrote an epistle to Timothy, and he said this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He did not say whom I was chief. He says of whom I am chief. You see, Paul, his name was Saul of Tarsus. He was the biggest persecutor of the church when the church got started he hated christ he thought he was a false god he did everything he could to hurt the kingdom of god and then he got saved and he became god's biggest proponent he did everything he could for the kingdom of god after he got saved but he never looked back at his time and said i was the chief of sinners he said i am the chief of sinners he said in romans oh wretched man that i am Not that I was. He also said, I've not yet arrived. He also said, I am the least of all saints. I'm the least. Now, you and I would look at Paul the Apostle, and we'd say, I beg to differ. You're the greatest of all saints. You're not the chief of sinners. You're the greatest Christian, and uh, you're not a wretched man. Boy, I wish I could be like you, and I know you may not feel that you've arrived yet, but you're so much further down the road than I am. We would say that of him, but what he said of himself was, I just need God's mercy. You know what I've learned? The closer a person gets to God, the more holy they see God is 
and the more wretched they see they themselves are. And that the only thing we've got going for us is the grace and mercy of God. And when the closer you get to God and you realize it's all about the grace and mercy of God, then you start treating other people that way with grace and mercy. He is the God of my mercy. Let's give you one last thought. Look at Micah chapter number 7. You say, what? Yeah, Micah. It's a minor prophet. He never made it to the majors. <laughs> Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and then Nahum. That's where it's at. Micah chapter 7. Last verse, last point, last thought. And then I'm going to give you a concluding thought. So when I give you point number seven, don't pack your, your brains up yet. Um, I got one a concluding thought that's going to kind of wrap everything all together. Micah chapter 7. Are you there? All right, look at verse 7. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Number six and last. Not only is God the God of my fathers and the God of my rock and the God of my life and the God of my strength and the God of my mercy, but he's also the God of my salvation. He's the God of my salvation. Now, there's two aspects to that. First of all, letter A, he wants to save us from going to hell. He wants to save us from going to hell. Listen to me very carefully. God is not the God of your salvation just because you believe in him. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins, if you believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, if you believe nobody gets to heaven except for through Christ, now you can be saved. But it doesn't mean you are. You have to come to that God, that, that, that Jesus that you believe in, and you have to say, Lord, save me from going to hell and take me to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, it says, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then it says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. What he was saying is, Yes, you believe in me. Yes, you have lived for me. But you never asked me to save you. You never asked. That's why in Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The implication is, if you don't call upon him, you're not saved. If you do, you are. Why would I call upon him? Because I believed in him. So it has to start from my heart, and then it goes up into my mouth, and I call upon him. So listen, he wants to be the God of your salvation, but you have to ask him to save you from going to hell. And take you to heaven. When you do that, he will save you and take you to heaven. But the second application, letter B, he wants to deliver us when we're in trouble. He wants to deliver us when we're in trouble. Think about it when Peter was walking on the water out to Jesus. He saw the wind and the waves and he, and he started to doubt and he started to sink. He said three words to Jesus. Lord, save me. He wasn't asking Jesus to save him from going to hell. He was asking the Lord to save him from drowning. And the Bible says immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You know what God says? When you're in trouble and you need help, come to me. Come to me. By the way, it doesn't matter if the help, uh, the trouble you're in was self-inflicted or the trouble you're in was from someone else. When Peter was walking on water, it was self-inflicted help. That, or trouble that he was in because he started doubting. There was no person that told him, don't do this, don't believe in God, you're a bad person. There was no person attacking him. He was walking out in the water and he started to doubt. And he did it to himself. And he said, Lord, save me. Jesus said, I will. Why are you in trouble today? Is it because of your own self that you got yourself into that mess? Or is it because someone else outside of your life was attacking you? It don't matter what the reason you're in trouble is. Come to Jesus. He wants to be the God of your salvation. He wants to deliver you. Man, I, I remember one time in 2009, I found myself in a mess financially. Oh, I got, nobody got me in that mess but me. I was the one that did it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, I just was foolish. I didn't have good, solid 
biblical principles when it came to personal finances. And so uh, I went to God said, oh, God, help me. He said, go, go, go to a Dave Ramsey financial peace seminar. Go take financial peace university. So I did. And I got my bearings straight when it came to my personal finances. And it took five years from 2009 to 2013. But God finally gave us financial freedom. It was great. It was wonderful. God did it. But God helped me because I, you know, I was in trouble. Are you in trouble today? What? Financial? Health? Marital? Child rearing? Uh, job? You need a job? Um, what, what is it? Depression? What's your need? Go to him. He wants to be the God of your salvation. Now, here's the application. If you want, listen this carefully, God to be the God of your fathers, the God of your rock, the God of your life, the God of your strength, the God of your mercy, and the God of your salvation. Here's what you got to do. We have to choose to let God be personal to us. We have to choose it. In uh, Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea, and I'll wrap up with this, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in unto him, and I will sup with him. You know what God says? He wants to be the God of your fathers, the God of your rock, the God of your life, the God of your strength, the God of your mercy, and the God of your salvation. All you have to do is open the door. If you don't open the door, then this is not for you. The prodigal son went into the, went into the world, wasted his substance with riotous living, fell on hard times, hit rock bottom, and realized he had nothing. Why? It's because he didn't open the door to the Heavenly Father to be all that for him. But he came home, and it all changed. All you have to do is open the door, and God will be all of these things for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much.